Artificial intelligence just played a big role in restoring movement in a paralyzed man. Yeah, and this gives a lot of hope for artificial intelligence and healthcare in the future. This is Keith Thomas, and he suffered a spine injury that left him paralyzed from the neck down. But he just underwent a 15 hour open brain surgery, where doctors went in and implemented this thing called a double neural bypass system. But the most amazing part to me is that the artificial intelligence that was learning his brain waves is what's actually converting converting the electrical signal into the what's bypassing over the parts that aren't working. Like essentially artificial intelligence is reading his mind in a literal sense and then taking an action to move what he wants it to move. So prior to the surgery, the team spent months mapping through MRI maps how his brain works. So they knew ahead of time what parts were actually responsible for arm movement and things like that. And it reminded me of the AI project we talked about a few months ago where scientists were actually putting people to sleep and they were reading their dreams and converting them into images. I mean, can you believe that this is not science fiction anymore? Like when I was a kid, if I thought about something like this, I would have said it was a thousand years into the future, but it's like technically it's now in the past. And of course it's not commonplace, it's very experimental, but like it's here and it happened. So this pioneering approach not only let Thomas move his arms and there is expectations that he's gonna start naturally recovering from being paralyzed from his injury. Now let's talk about this new AI driven skin patch that you can put on your neck, but it's full of really tiny digital sensors that are gonna keep track of how your body's actually acting. So this nifty little patch is designed to monitor 11 health signals from your neck. And what they're building towards is a future where if you're interacting with a robot, some kind of like humanoid robot type thing, it can directly send that information to the robot so it knows how you feel. Like having a symbiotic relationship, like you and the robot can actually sort of feel the same emotions from the body because it's getting a sense for the same senses you're actually generating. So this digital second skin data collector constantly monitors and checks in on your speech, neck movement, touch, breathing, and heart rate. So artificial intelligence is making inroads into detecting heart disease. Imagine that your heart is the drummer in a band and it's setting the beat for the rest of the body. But what if your drummer starts playing an extra rhythm that doesn't fit the soundtrack? Well, that's kind of like what happens when you have cardiovascular disease. And that causes a whopping 17 million global curtain calls per year. And it's really hard for doctors. Using this metaphor, they basically have to try to get the drummer back on beat while the rest of the band keeps playing. Like, you have to stay alive, you have to have some rhythm the entire time. So you can't just like reset the heart at any moment. But now some artificial intelligence experts have decided to train a neural network on a whole bunch of regular heartbeats. From there, they have a baseline and a machine intelligence can look at any kind of minute sound to determine, is this actually out of sync? Long before the human ear, like a doctor with a stethoscope could ever hear it. And here's the cool thing, already in the real world, working with patient data, it's way more accurate than humans. It nailed the location of the rogue heartbeats 82% of the time. And it's only gonna get better from here. Now let's talk about another important place where medicine and pattern detection can play a big difference in health outcomes. And that's the surprising role in understanding just what's the best embryo, an egg, using IVF. So have you ever been to an arcade before and used one of those like giant claw machines to try to get a stuffed animal? Like you can see the cute stuffed animal that you want. It looks really easy, but for some reason you just can't get it right. Well, that's what it can feel like for one in five married women in the United States who are trying to become moms, but they're having fertility struggles. So they might opt for in vitro fertilization, which is known as IVF, but that's really like a high stakes, super expensive version of that claw arcade machine game. And sadly, just like the arcade version, you don't always get a win, but enter stage right. AI VF. That's right. They're combining AI artificial intelligence with IVF in vitro fertilization. So it's AI and then double VF. But the basic premise is they're using artificial intelligence with extremely good pattern recognition, super refined control over that claw game at the arcade. But this one picks up the best, most robust and healthiest embryos for the win. So right now the average IVF win rate is only about 24%. But the creators of AI VF are confident they can do way better than that. Because the artificial intelligence can pick up on these super tiny details of the embryo that the human eye just can't. Little details like potential genetic hiccups or even how likely the embryo is to be implanted. Some of these things you couldn't tell with the human eye, but there's some pattern in there that's happening for some reason that enough artificial intelligence that can see details notices that a human won't. And then it actually gives like each embryo a score just like in a video game and then goes for the pick. Plus the whole thing is much faster than the old way too. So it's just less stress on the woman. Did you know that the world now has a drug that was created completely by artificial intelligence called INS 
018 underscore 055. Now the drug is meant to tackle this really nasty lung disease called idiopathic plumatory fibrosis, which right now is giving a tough time to about 100,000 folks in the US. But as we speak, there are brave volunteers in China who have taken this AI generated medicine to see if it helps. So they're going through an ongoing 12 week testing period, but so far things are looking really good and there's plans to expand the test groups. I wanted to give you an update on just how good Google's Palm 2 Med model is at diagnosing diseases. So researchers threw it a lot of curveballs and a whole bunch of medical mumbo jumbo, and they didn't even make it seem like it all came from a unified source, like the way a whole bunch of disconnected doctors might actually do things. But even with all those things in its way, the AI actually managed to diagnose 27 out of the 70 cases and was approximately accurate in 64%. So there's also some hope that robots are gonna revolutionize the way that we actually take care of people with dementia. There's now a new robot that's powered by artificial intelligence that can move around a room and find lost things. So it's a mobile manipulator. And the interesting thing about it is it gets a list of everything that should be in an environment and it uses object detection algorithms to know where everything is at all times. Then using sensors and cameras, whenever somebody, especially with dementia, is just loses track of the important things, whether that be medicine or whatever, it knows to go get them either at the right time or on request. And it knows where the objects usually should be basically when they're put away. But it also knows the last time they've been seen, how often they're in other places and all sorts of other patterns about where they end up. But one thing that I hadn't really thought through very deeply was just what it will be like in the future when we have robots that know where all the objects in our lives are. I mean, we might get really lazy because I already lose my AirPods and stuff all the time and I use my Apple phone to find them. But imagine an artificial intelligence. It's like, oh, the extension cord, it's in the garage. Light bulbs, left shoes, Christmas ornaments. Like it knows where they all are. Like losing things will be a thing of the past. The next generation might actually lose everything, but never have any worry about not getting access to it whenever they want. I was just like, oh, that'll be really different world. Even if they want something and it's not there immediately, that probably some kind of drone from Amazon can like just fly it to you as like 10 minutes. Okay, so back to the medical stuff. But the next thing I wanna talk about is actually the EQ, whether the doctor, he or she, is actually connecting with their patient. So it turns out, and at first I didn't love this, but now I kind of think it is useful, that a lot of doctors are using things like ChatGPT to actually customize the messages that they're emailing out or saying to patients. And they're doing it to add empathy, to add some kind of a nuanced emotional connection to it that doctors sometimes just aren't good at or don't have time to do really. And I don't know exactly how I feel about this, but I do understand that a doctor is an expert and it kind of makes sense that they treat us a little bit like cattle, right? Like we come through and they, they're they trying to optimize their time. They have specialized knowledge and skills and you know, if they have to be a little blunt with some facts, I get it. Like it just help me with my medical needs. But there's other elements of like recovery and connection that when you have with a doctor, a real relationship, it makes it a lot better. But a new study showed that ChatGPT's responses to inquiries from a patient are rated as higher than what the doctor actually says and does. In this study though, it's about in terms of being empathetic, not just like quality of care. Have you ever wondered if machine learning can be used to predict childhood obesity? Well, I've got some answers for you because it seems like an AI crystal ball has arrived. So they trained an artificial intelligence system on a whole bunch of different things you can measure in their first thousand days of life. So yeah, they're still in diapers. And see if you could correlate any of those factors into them growing up to be a little bit pudgy. So they use one of the classic machine learning algorithms called lasso regression, which essentially shrinks a bunch of data values into certain points. It's kind of like a multi-dimensional average, you could say. And using it, you can help see which of the early factors are actually most related to the outcome. And that's important because it helped us learn what some of the big red flags flags are when you have a child. And here's the red flags that have found. A child being born by C-section increases their odds. How well a child sleeps makes a big difference. If the parent had health problems during the pregnancy, that matters. So now this machine learning algorithm can give some clues whether people need to step in and kind of start trying to correct that early in life. This is nanobot technology at its finest. A tiny wiggly spring has been built that is so small it can grab the tail of an individual sperm. Once it grabs onto the tail, it can use its little power to motor it up to the egg. Boom, fertilization. And look, you can see with 17.7 million views on Twitter, this is inspiring an entire generation. That's what we need. 
The next dependent lazy generation. Okay, come on. I don't think it correlates like that. I don't even want to be here, mom. You had to shove me into an egg. Okay, they would never remember that. Okay, it's not like there's a tiny little baby in the sperm spinning around. So that gif is not accurate. People are sleeping on nanotech. It's changing the world. Well, I'm sure he's going to be a real go-getter. You know, good point. Work smarter, not harder. That might be the message from that baby. That's a terrible idea. The healthy sperm are supposed to compete to get to the egg. That nanobot may pick the weakest. But is it the strength in it that actually makes it the... Yeah, maybe. That's interesting. I think you're judging it without knowing the details. I don't know. But I do know that if you have any thoughts, you should leave them in the comments below. And if you want to help me get to 6,000 subscribers, my next goal, smash that subscribe button.